I want to read a, a, a few verses of scripture found in the gospel of John, the good news about Jesus from John's perspective, John chapter 21. And uh, I want to begin reading at verse number one. And if you are with me and if you're ready for the word in that chat, I just want you to put ready with an exclamation point. Ready, ready, ready. Listen to what John says. John records this incident, John chapter 21, verse number one. It says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. I want to stop reading there and I want to tag a title to this text. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. Part 2,693,000 of Faith University. I want to talk from this subject. Faith after failure. <laughs> Faith after failure. Ladies and gentlemen, I can make very few guarantees in this life. But there is one that I feel very adamant about articulating and very safe in suggesting. There is one aspect of our existence that every single individual who is watching and listening to this message will ultimately and inevitably experience. You, sir, you, ma'am, will experience Failure. Failure can be defined, listen to this, as a situation or an occurrence in which something does not work out as it should. <laughs> a situation or an occurrence where something does not work out as it should. And if anyone were to honestly audit their life they would have to honestly admit in one area or another I have experienced failure or I am experiencing failure where there are some outcomes that are inconsistent with our expectations well, there are some things that we in good faith and with good measure attempted to accomplish and achieve. We invested time. We invested talent. And sometimes we even invested treasure only to experience an outcome that was disappointing and sometimes pushed us to the place of despair. We will ultimately deal with a degree and a dimension of failure. No matter how proactive we are, <laughs> no matter how passionate we are, no matter how prepared we intend to be, this is a relentless stalker-like reality that in one season of your life or another will chase you down, tap you on your shoulder and say, sit with me a little while. We will all deal with the reality of failure. 
Now, I feel safe in suggesting this for three reasons. This is going to be an inevitable reality for us for three reasons. Here's number one. Number one, it is an inevitable reality because you are and I am an imperfect person. Hmm. So when I say imperfection, I don't mean we do some things imperfectly. The nature of imperfection suggests you do everything imperfectly. So there are some things we do better than others. But we engage in no activity at any point that is independent of some sort of mistake, consciously or unconsciously. So this means there will be times that we contribute to our own calamity. Because despite how well-intentioned we are, despite how meticulous we are, because we operate with a degree of imperfection, it means we don't operate with omniscience. So that means there's some things I don't know. So I'm making decisions with the limited information that's exposed to me. And the quality of my decisions is tied to the quality of my information. So as confident as I am at times, and as convinced as I may be at times, I got to recognize recognize there's still some things God knows that I don't know we're imperfect so this means I make imperfect decisions watch this it also means I have imperfect emotions because God's the only one that feels perfectly yeah Everything he feels should be felt. See, just because the feelings are real doesn't mean they're right. See, because my emotions are imperfect, this means sometimes we're offended and we should be, shouldn't be. Sometimes <laughs> we feel neglected and we shouldn't. Sometimes we feel dis and dismissed when we shouldn't. But God has perfect emotions. So when he feels jealous, he should. And so because we are imperfect emotionally, it means that our emotions from time to time are going to impact decisions that we make. And it's going to create imperfect decisions. So I'm going to mismanage some opportunities. <laughs> going to make some mistakes with certain relationships. Going to miss it with certain conversations. It doesn't mean I'm evil. It just means I'm imperfect. And imperfection versus perfection is a human divine distinction. It is what distinguishes the human from the divine. And the reality of my imperfection is not intended to make me feel less about me. <laughs> it's not intended to make me feel worse about me. It's intended for me to feel better about God. <sighs> Right? So the revelation of what I'm not should not produce focus on who I'm not. The revelation of what I'm not should produce focus on who he is. I need him. I love him. He's keeping me. He's protecting me. Wrong decision still got in the right room. That wasn't you. That wasn't me. That was God. Imperfect person. But, but not only are we an imperfect person. And that's going to contribute to things not turning out as they should. We are also in relationship with imperfect people. Yes, sir. Are y'all ready for this? If you're ready, put yes in the chat. If you're not sure, put I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know yet. I thought I was ready earlier, but I wasn't. Here, here it is. Here it is. I want you to catch this. Our life is not... <laughs> Gosh, our life is not only impacted by the reality of our imperfections. Our life is also impacted by the reality of the imperfections of those we in relationship with. This is why God, now I don't, I don't want this to turn into a conversation on moralism or behaviorism. That's not where I'm going with this. But God says a whole lot in scripture about behavior. Because he's not just thinking about you. 
he understands that the implications of our behavior go beyond us. This is the way Solomon put it in Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. I become like who I walk with. I don't have to be a fool to suffer harm. I just need to be a companion of a person that is spiritually insensitive and unaware. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you have children... Your life is impacted by their decisions. When you say I do, your life is impacted by their decisions. Family, parents, your life is impacted by their decisions. And there are times, listen to this, where things don't turn out the way that they should. Not because of our imperfections but because of the imperfections of those that we're in relationship with. See, sometimes it's not that relationships or marriages don't work because nobody wanted them to work. (sighs) But we are impacted by the imperfections of others. So listen to this. So I'm an imperfect person. I'm in relationship with imperfect people. And thirdly, I live in an imperfect place. Right? So the scriptures kind of speak to this, that this world does not exist as God intended. So when we see good, bad things that happen to good people and we're perplexed and we're confused, God all throughout scripture consistently has been communicating, this world is like this. This is why I got to create another one. So, so, so there, are, there are circumstances sometimes that are beyond our control that contribute to whether or not things turn out the way that they should. You can build a home, but you can't control if a hurricane comes. Come on. You, you can drive on your side of the road, and you can be a responsible driver, but you can't control what the person in the car next to you does. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You can t- determine your behavior, but you can't control your, d- your genetic tendencies and bloodline issues and things that are passed down so sometimes it's not that I happen or others happen sometimes life happens and it stops things from turning out as they should however I'm a preacher Caruso Herald, one who speaks on behalf of another, one who does not carry his or her own message, but simply delivers mail that's been delivered to them. And the adjective that the scriptures use to describe the mail that the preacher is supposed to deliver is called gospel. And gospel simply means good news. I got to pause for the cause and let you know today. I got some good news. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? I said I've got some good news. See, I am, here's the good news. I'm not articulating what I'm articulating about failure to reveal to you what is not possible. Did you hear what I just said? No, no, no. I, 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 I am revealing what I'm revealing or articulating what I'm articulating about failure to help you see that failure can simply be a path to possibility. Did you hear what I just said? See, see, we will all, we will all have failure, but whether or not failure has us is based on whether or not we see failure as a place or a path. Did you hear? (laughs) Yeah, the difference, y'all better come get me today. I said the difference between those that recover and those that don't is not always their experience with failure, but their view of failure. Some people saw it as a place. Other people saw it as a path. Those that see it as a place stay in the grave. 
Okay, y'all miss. <laughs> Those that see it as a place, stay in the grave and complain about how Judas put me here and how I didn't deserve this and how Pilate didn't have enough courage to stop this. And they have pity parties in that place. But those who see it as a path says, I am in here, but I'm only going to be here for three days. And early Sunday morning, I'm getting out of here because this isn't a place. This is a path. So maybe that last relationship didn't work, but it doesn't have to be your place. It can be your path. Maybe the last business venture didn't work, but it doesn't have to be a place. It can be a path. Maybe the last spiritual venture didn't turn out the way you anticipated, but it doesn't have to be a pay place. It can be a path. You don't have to go to. You go through. Yea, though. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not failure itself that makes it fatal or final. It's not failure. It's not failure. It's how you see it. Is it a place or is it a path? And the text that we read in John 20 is an amazing example. 21, excuse me, is an amazing example of what I'm attempting to articulate. We read it together. The first verse in John 21 suggests this. It says, I love this, and Jesus appeared again to his disciples <laughs> by the Sea of Galilee. Now this seems simple, mundane, unimportant, unnecessary why does John give us all this detail he didn't just say he appeared he said he appeared again which is really all we needed to know but he didn't stop at him appearing again he said he appeared again by the sea of Galilee so it seems as if John's taking or engaging in some extraordinary effort to give us some detail that seems unnecessary. But there's nothing in the book that's unnecessary. Now, everything in the Bible isn't equally relevant to you at every season. Like you're not talking to your five-year-old about revelation in end times, right? But everything in scripture is equally relevant in some season. So, 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 so why does John tell us he appeared again by the Sea of Galilee. I want you to know these details are important because without these details, we wouldn't know if Jesus fulfilled a prophetic promise he made after the resurrection. Here it is in Matthew 28. Jesus, <laughs> through a messenger, an angel, says to the disciples, okay, he is risen from the dead and is, and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Y'all missed it. <laughs> so the disciples come to the tomb looking for Jesus. The angel says, he ain't here. I mean, he tells Mary, he ain't here. Excuse me, Mary comes, right? He tells Mary, he ain't here. But Mary, you go tell the disciples yeah. <laughs> that you're looking for him in the tomb. But you're going to only find him in Galilee. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Watch this now. He promised to meet them at a place. And so when John tells us he appears again by the Sea of Galilee, he is showing us the fulfillment of this prophetic promise. He's saying, I will show up if you meet me where I send you. And some of you are looking for me, but you're not at Galilee. 
Yeah, okay, I'm going to say that. <laughs> you like, where is God? He's like, at Galilee. Yeah, where, where am I? I'm at the place I sent you. And if you go to the place I sent you, not just physically, maybe emotionally, not just physically, maybe spiritually. God, I don't feel you. I don't see you. He's saying, get to Galilee. I love it. It's, it's, he, 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 he gives him instruction on where to go. And, and I think this even gives us some insight into like prophetic ministry, right? Like how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to steward prophetic ministry. Like when I am the recipient or the beneficiary of uncommon insight that comes through humans from the omniscient one. When I'm the beneficiary of that, how do I steward it? And it seems like mm, very often the way we steward it or respond to it is with praise. But the disciples responded with placement. So if we get, if we become beneficiaries of prophetic ministry and all we do is praise, we've mismanaged and we've been poor stewards of the prophetic word. The prophetic word doesn't come just to move you. It comes to move you. He says, I'm telling you this so that you can get to Galilee and be in Galilee at the right time, at the right place. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. And your movement and your placement is actually an indication or a revelation regarding whether or not you actually believe the word. Because you can't tell me you believe it's going to rain and you're not building an ark. <laughs> yeah, if you believe God's going to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think are you building the ark if you believe he's going to blow you up from the flow up are you building the ark are you managing your life that way are you making sure that enemies don't have ammunition to use against you did you hear what i'm saying yeah if you believe he's going to do something significant so the disciples go to galilee now, this is so interesting. And Peter says, John tells us, Peter says, I'm about to go fishing. This seems insignificant, mundane, unnecessary. Why do we need to know Peter's going fishing? Let's not push past this because it could be profound. Peter's a fisherman by trade. Fishing was what he was doing before he got found. When Jesus called him, he called him from doing one kind of fishing to another. He didn't really change the activity. He redeemed the expression. See, you're going to do the same thing. You're just going to do it differently. See, okay, did you hear that? Okay, think about that. He said, you're going to do what you do. You're just going to do it differently. This is what you do. So I'm not going to change what you do. I'm going to change the way you do it. Because this is what you do. When I look at what God's, it, like, when I look at how I'm serving God in this season, I'm just doing what I do. <laughs> did you hear what I just said? Yeah, so this is interesting now. He's going fishing. This would not be an issue without understanding, watch this, the story behind the statement. It's not just what he said. We need to ask why he say that. <laughs> this is after a string of disappointments. See, this is something at some point, I'm going to have to do some teaching on this. A string of disappointment beginning with Judas. Because I don't hear us talk about often how did Judas' betrayal affect the disciples? Because 
come on now. Especially John, because John keeps bragging on how much he loved Jesus, you know, or how much Jesus loved him, the one who Jesus loved. Like, you know, it's like, I love this man, and you just did this. Just, so there's these string of disappointments. Don't miss this. And there's also personal failure. You got Judas's disappointment, but Peter's got his own denial issues. He says, I'm going back fishing after I failed. I failed him. He told me I was going to deny him three times. I said, I'm never leaving you. And he told me I was going to deny him three times. And I did. So maybe he's put... (laughs) Maybe he's experienced personal failure to the degree that he's assuming that all that Jesus had promised him prior to his failure is no longer an option. So all the stuff you said to me about being a rock and all the stuff you said to me about (laughs) about your declaration being the revelation upon which I was going to build my church. All these things that I said that he said he was going to do through me. Maybe that's no longer an option. Because I failed. Maybe I just disqualified myself from what I feel destined for. Therefore, he's potentially resorting to going back to fishing for fish because he believes he's no longer qualified to fish for men. Tario, let's get ready to get out of here. I'm almost done. Here it is. <laughs> As it was for Peter, so it is for you and me. It's possible to experience personal failure to the degree that you make assumptions about your assignment. What message are you allowing the failure to send to you? did you hear what I just said Jesus never said he was done with Peter but somebody told Peter that it's probably failure because failure has a voice see failure doesn't just talk to you about your past failure talks to you about your future (laughs) yeah when you fail in that present failure starts talking to you now about what's not going to happen in the future and what you just blew in the future and what cannot happen in the future and I believe failure started talking to Peter say everybody know I denied him how can I look my my peers in the face How am I going to look Jesus in the face? What is Jesus going to think about me? I'm going back fishing. Now watch this. Here's the danger in the approach. The text says when Peter says, I'm going fishing. Verse 3, it says the disciple said, we'll go with you. y'all in the words of Martin is that marinate let that marinate he says I'm going backwards this is all I know how to do this is what I'm going to have to settle for and as a result of that people he has y'all missed this (laughs) he doesn't even see his influence so his failure is telling him something about his influence that the disciples actions are refuting the fact that they said we will go with you is an indication he still got influence with them he doesn't even see that he still has what he thought he lost Because when you go backwards, you take them with you. So they get on the boat, y'all. I'm done. I'm done. They get on the boat. Here it is. They get on the boat. And the Bible says they fish all night. 
and they caught nothing. Hmm. They know how to fish. That's what they do. But when you try to go backwards and God's called you to go forward, what worked in a previous season won't work in this one. He says, you think you can go back to that, but you can't because I have watched y'all not talking to me. I removed my blessing. I removed my endorsement. So you think you can go back because you got the skill. You still don't know that even to fish well, you need favor. <laughs> you got the skill, but you still need me. Yeah, yeah, you, st- you still need me. You, even when you didn't know you needed me, you still needed me. Even when you thought it was just your skill, it was still me. Even when you weren't looking toward me, I was looking out for you. It, I caused it to rain on the just and the unjust. I, I give you what John Wesley calls prevenient grace. It is grace that is extended to you before you have a revelation of what grace is. It is grace that draws you into a revelation of God's grace. It is grace that you are mislabeling before you get in relationship with God. It's grace you call luck. You called it fortune. And God's like you had no idea. I've been looking looking out for you in this previous season because I knew there was coming a season where you would be mine. It's always been me. So you just can't go back because you got skill. So all of a sudden they look out to the shore and they see somebody standing there. They see somebody standing on the shore. Watch this now. And verse 4 says, early in the morning. So they've been fishing all night. But early in the morning, Jesus is standing by the shore. So I'm sitting here saying, why'd you let them fish all night? Why did you wait till in the morning to come stand on the shore? Couldn't you come? At night? I mean, you went walking on the sea. You can come at night. But maybe Jesus came early in the morning (laughs) because they wouldn't be as open to instruction if they hadn't come up empty all night. (laughs) See, some people won't listen to your advice. Because their net hadn't been empty long enough. You tried to help them at night. You should have waited till in the morning. (laughs) Come on now. Yeah, they net is empty, but they still think they are expert. Now, both of these things, come on. Yeah, they, <laughs> they net is empty, but they still think they're an expert and they're an authority. And Jesus said, let me wait. Let me let them do this all night. Because they're going to ob- obey my instruction without an argument. So he says this. I I love the way they phrase the question. The writer doesn't say that Jesus said, have you caught any fish? John says that Jesus calls out to them and says, friends, haven't you any fish? It's almost like there's a difference between have y'all caught something and y'all ain't caught nothing? Jesus saying, y'all, y'all ain't calling anything? They say, no. Jesus says, well, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> I want you to throw your net on the right side of the boat. And then you'll find some. Now, they've been in that same sea, in that same boat, with that same net, all night, and caught nothing. They could have assumed that the sea was the problem. Or the boat was the problem or the net was the problem but Jesus said I want you to use that same boat in that same sea and take that same net I just want you to throw it on a different side of the boat 
And the Bible says when they throw it, look, I'm running out of time. But if I had time, I'd talk to you about the right side. <laughs> Sometimes we coming up empty because you're not throwing it on the right side. Watch this. I'm done. They come up with a huge haul of fish. Huge haul. And when this happens, John says, wait a minute. This the Lord. Peter immediately jumps into the sea, swims to the shore. The Bible says that Jesus has a fire started. Y'all don't believe me. The text says there's a fire. Verse 9. There's a fire of burning coals there with fish already on it. (laughs) Fish are already on the on the fire. He already got fish. They fishing for fish. He already got. <laughs> I'm telling you what to get. How already? What I already have. Oh my God. I already got it. He's already cooking it. <laughs> I'm not going to give you mine. I'm going to show you how to get your own. And the Bible says they get together with him and he says, come sit down. Let's have some breakfast. And I'm looking at all of this. And I'm I'm observing and examining everything they had to overcome to actually have this experience. And we talked about Peter's personal failure. But then also, don't miss this, y'all. They had a season, a night of empty nets. So there's personal failure and then there's empty nets where I've tried to engage in some activity and I've come up empty. And I sat and thought about this and asked myself the question. When it comes to failure, are we examining the survival of the wrong things? See, when I look at this story, I was like, man, they lost a lot, but his faith survived. His faith survived failure. I think sometimes we look at, did the business survive quarantine and lockdowns did the relationship survive a challenge did that the church survive did the the, the but there's another question did faith survive failure are you still willing to throw your net on the right side of the boat even when you failed personally And you fished and came up with empty nets. Here's my question. Have you gone back fishing, not physically, but mentally? What do you mean, Darius? Have you come to a conclusion as a result of your personal failure and empty nets? that God can't do or won't do what he intended to do through you. If you have consciously or unconsciously come to that conclusion, you've gone back fishing. And you survived failure, but your faith didn't. And I'm telling you to go back and get your faith. 
I'm not just asking, did you survive? It almost, it almost took me out of here, Pastor, but I survived. Praise God. But did your faith survive? This story tells us and teaches us the power of faith after failure. This belief, watch this, that God is faithful and what he accomplishes in and through and for us is tied and predicated to his goodness and not just ours. I'm going to say that again, <laughs> that what he wants to do in us, through us, and for us is not just tied to our goodness. It's tied to, to, to his. It's his goodness, not ours. I said, are you allowing failure to speak in the place of God? Is failure having the final say? And I'm telling you today, they would have missed out on a miracle if they would have let personal failure and empty nets cause them not to, to cause them to not to try again. And I'm praying that that won't be you who's watching this. Listen, I would have quit everything if it was based on how many times I failed. I would have quit everything. Everything. There are times I preach sermons and, <laughs> and walked off the platform and say, I don't, I don't think I need to do that no more. Yeah. Times where I didn't know if I was going to survive, but faith did. And so I have one question for you today. And that is, do you, listen to me, still believe? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you still believe? I want to pray for you today, and I'm praying very specifically in the words of Peter Wagner. This is targeted strategic prayer in this moment. And I want to pray specifically for, watch this, the consequence of failure uh, watch this the consequence of failure that often turns into condemnation and that condemnation and that guilt and that shame is kryptonite to faith because it puts us in a place and position that we don't believe we're worthy of deserving of what God wants to do in and through us and for us so, Father, I pray now for those who maybe like Peter have dealt with some personal failure. I pray for those that are watching that are like the disciples who had some empty nets. They've tried and tried and they've fished all night and come up empty. I, I pray for those that are dealing with shame and condemnation. They're being tormented by the voice of failure and of fear. I thank you. I thank you that even now your Holy Spirit, which is a liberator, that even now it's liberating those minds and those hearts from those thoughts that you're tearing down those strongholds, those unbiblical, unhealthy thinking patterns. I thank you for that. I thank you for revelation that's coming to your people, their eyes being open to see that failure can be a path and it doesn't have to be a place. I thank you for this. And I ask this in Jesus' name. If you receive it, say amen. Clap your hands in the studio. Put some fire in the chat.